Good evening, everybody, and thank you sincerely for joining us for this webinar advocating for your child's rights in education. Really pleased to be joined this evening um, by Mary Lee, our, our Information Officer at Inclusion Ireland, um, and Mary is also the coordinator with the Connect Family Network, So, um, and has been doing a lot of work in the background to get us here this evening. Um, very pleased to welcome you all. Um, I know you're taking time out of your busy lives and busy schedules to be with us here. And I'm hoping that by the end of the session today, that there's something that you can take away that's useful for you and for your family. I suppose just to say from the beginning, this this is a safe and supportive space for you as a family member. Um, we know that you're on a journey and we're here with you at, at Inclusion Ireland. And indeed, many of our team at Inclusion Ireland are family members themselves as somebody with an intellectual disability. So we know and we have a deep understanding of what's happening on the ground for people and what's happening across the country in education for you and for your children. So we're, it is a safe place to ask questions. Um, what we're suggesting this evening is if you have a question to pop it into the Q&A box that you'll see down at the bottom of your screen. And we'll do our absolute best to answer as many of those questions as we can this evening. We were thrilled as well over the last couple of weeks since announcing um, this information session to have really great engagement from our members and from um, families across the country. So we've we've had a number of emails and phone calls with questions in advance, which I hope we've woven into our presentation this evening and we'll do our absolute best to answer those questions that we received over the last couple of weeks. If we don't get to the level of detail that you would have hoped for this evening, there's, it's also available to you to call us at Inclusion Ireland to get more information. There might be a more in-depth conversation you want to have with us about your own particular situation and your child's situation. And we're happy to do that. We, we offer an information and signposting service, so feel free to call us. And we will send out more information after the session this evening as well, so that you have a resource to work with at home too. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now to get started um, and just to say a very big thank you to our partners for this evening, IRD Dulhallow, um, who've come on board to support us and to share the information about the session this evening. Um, so we're really grateful to them. And it's always lovely to have a community partner to work, work together on talks like this. So I know Stephanie is here this evening from IRD Dulhallow and thank you for that. So just this evening, I suppose I'll give you a little snapshot, a little bit about Inclusion Ireland for people who may not be familiar with us or our work. We'll then go into, because this is really important that we're rooted in the current reality for children and their families across the country. So I'll paint a bit of a picture about what we're hearing about children in school right now. I'm going to give a bit of information about the broader context of what's happening in education right now, including something you may have heard of, which is the Education for Persons with Special Educational Needs, that's quite a mouthful. Um, the review of that legislation is happening at the moment. So I'll give you a bit of information about that and maybe how you can get involved. I'll give, we'll give a snapshot of information about your child's rights and how to get more information if you have a particular issue or concern. And the bit that I'd like to focus on the most, and this is from our learning as an organization who have supported families for, for over 60 years and supported children in education for as long as that, um, about getting support as a parent on this journey. And this journey can be challenging, it can be long, there can be all sorts of joys, bumps on the road that people encounter and how you get support as a parent is so essential. And then some tips when you're advocating for, for your child, practical tips when you're going to meetings and when you're trying to get um, information and how you can go about doing that effectively. And then at the end, just maybe for us to have a call to action together, how can we work together? Because this is a long road towards having a fully inclusive model of education that meets all of the children's needs um, who we support at Inclusion Ireland. So just a little bit about Inclusion Ireland very briefly. I've, our full purpose is to work towards the full inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities by supporting people to have their voices heard and advocating for rights under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I will talk about that in a little bit, about what the UNCRPD has to say about education. And our, our focus always is to build inclusive schools, 
communities and workplaces. That's where we spend all of our efforts and our time. And we're very determined about this, that we will not stop until every child and adult with an intellectual disability enjoys the same rights and freedoms as their non-disabled siblings and peers. That is something that is so critical to us. Um, and in everything we do, we take a rights-based and a human rights-based focus. Um, this is just an infographic that I thought was was nice to show you. Last year, um, we ran a seminar called The Pathway to Inclusive Education, and we know it's a long path and we fully understand how complex this is. Um, and in the opening address um, from one of the self-advocates we work with, she's a woman called Margaret Turley, um, and she has gone through the special education system herself. And she spoke so passionately about that need to belong and to be understood and to be valued as a child and then as an adult with an intellectual disability. And I just thought I'd share that image with you today because this really is about children belonging in their local school and having the supports, the guidance and everything that they need to flourish and to have the highest quality education that they absolutely deserve. And we're so determined to make that happen and to see that happen. And we need everybody who's at the table with us this evening to work with us on that. And that is going to be our mission over the next few years. Um, I suppose all of the things we do at Inclusion Ireland, we work for changes in law and policy. We provide an accessible information and signposting service for people with intellectual disabilities and for family members. We hold the state to account for its progress on people's rights. And you'll hear us in the media, you know, being critical or giving feedback to, to government and to state agencies when um, when we need to. And we're on the side of people with intellectual disabilities and their families, we're, we're here for you. So just to give a snapshot, because sometimes people come to talks about, about education and they hear about the wonderful things that should be in place for children. And I suppose we want to make sure that we're very rooted in the, the actual reality for children right now. So over the summer, we, we ran a survey with over a thousand responses and about a third of those were from family members and this is the kind of information that we gathered from people although 91 percent of parents said that they have a school place for their child the the percentage was much less at 72 percent reported that it was a school place with suitable supports for their child so a big percentage of children almost a third of children not getting the support that they need in school. They may have a school place, but is it the correct one? And are they getting the supports that they need? 27% of the parents indicated that their children have been attending, were attending school on a reduced timetable or for a shorter school day. And I'll get onto that later about your rights and your child's rights when they are on reduced timetables or on shorter school days. 56% of the parents said that their child is not going to the same school as other children of a similar age in their neighbourhood and community. And this is 2023, and we really need to see that change. And for those children, nearly 60% have to travel for more than 30 minutes, including 17% who are having to travel for more than an hour. So for all of you who've joined us this evening, many of you are living and breathing these statistics. You are part of this picture and you fully understand the impact that that's having on you and, and your child. The other facts that we gathered during the survey, 10% of the respondents said that their child had been secluded or confined in their school. Another 10% had been restrained or immobilized implying the use of physical force, mechanical device or medication at school. So that's that's a stark reality facing children right now. Only half of the people with intellectual disabilities who responded to our survey reported getting any help from staff in school about their career progression. And we have one self-advocate we work with all the time, and she's actually in Brussels this week presenting on on her story um, for International Day for people with intellectual disabilities. And how she describes it is that when she was 16 in school, she was noticing that all her friends and her peers started to have a plan for after school and nobody was talking to her about her plan for her future. And that really needs to change. Less than 10% of people with intellectual disabilities from our survey got a job after leaving school. 30% went to college or further training and 40% went to a day service. So they're the facts that we're dealing with. And that's that's the reality for children and family right now. And as I said, 
you are living and breathing this every day. I don't need to tell you about it, but I want to share that this is a picture across the country. Um, so I suppose to talk about when we're talking about advocacy, it's really important to root it in, in human rights and in children's rights. And that's why you'll hear us at Inclusion Ireland constantly talking about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children. Because it's really important that we start, stop thinking about this as something that's special or different that children need. It really is a basic human right to be able to go to your local school and get the support that you need. And that's why we take a human rights framework in all of our work, because we really need to push that agenda and to help people to see that this should be your child's right to go to their local school. So what the UNCRPD has to say about education is that people with disabilities will not be excluded from the general education system on the basis of disability, because that would be discrimination, and that they can access an inclusive quality and free primary education and secondary education on an equal basis with others in the communities in which they live. So that refers to all those children who we know who are traveling an hour, an hour and a half every day outside of their communities. That's directly against what the UNCRPD says is should be the case. And that Ireland must provide reasonable accommodations of a person's requirements and that people must receive the support they need within the general education system. So that's that's what we're aiming for and that's what we need to have a goal for. Um, and these are some of the other pieces of legislation, and I won't go into these in too much depth, but that are important for you to know about, about your child. And you can read more about this on our website. The Education Act 1998 sets out the right to education for everybody in the state and that the state must ensure that there is made available to each person in the state, including a person with a disability, support service and a level and quality of education appropriate to meeting the needs and abilities of that person. OK, if I refer back to the statistics earlier, whilst we've gone a long, long way in Ireland and made a lot of improvements, there is a long road to travel in this regard. Um, and now I mentioned earlier about this particular piece of legislation, which many of you will have heard of on the call, but maybe some of you haven't yet. And this is called the Epson Act. Um, it is the name that we have, which is the Education for Persons with Special Education Needs Act. and. This is the particular act that sets out the legal framework for the education of children with, as it's called in the act, special educational needs. The Epson Act includes the aim that children should be educated, but this is the piece that's important to note, wherever possible in an inclusive environment. So there's a little bit of letting ourselves off the hook here because it says wherever possible and that those with educational needs should have the same rights to an appropriate education. And the act also allowed for the establishment of the National Council for Special Education, which many of you will have dealt with. And I'll talk later about CNOs and the National Council for Special Education and your children's rights there as well. So I suppose there were many parts of the Epson Act that were started and have come into place, such as the establishment of the National Council for Special Education. But there were many parts of the Act that have never been started, including the provision for each child to have their own assessment, their own individual education plan, an appeals process, and also the cooperation between education and health services. So many of you might be nodding as you're listening to that because you're living again that reality every day, that interaction between education and health, um, the fact that children it's it's um, an option to have a student support plan, but it's it doesn't have any legal basis. And I'll come to that later on. So the Epson Act itself badly needs to be reviewed. Many parts of it need to be started, but it also needs to really take a human rights framework and to really reflect the United Nations Convention. Um, so we sit on the advisory group to influence um, the review of the Epson Act. And as part of that advisory group, that is what we're really recommending. We're really pushing for a more rights based focus in education and that all children should have the resources, the support that they need to go to their local school and that all schools should have the resources as well. And the teachers should have adequate training and supports to provide that optimum education experience. And we know we have a road to travel here. So consultations around this review are happening at the moment. Um, and what 
and it's really important for children and young people to have a voice in all of that. And it's really important for families to also have a voice in this. So please um, have a look at our website, have a look at our social media, because we'll keep people posted about how they can engage with the Epson Act. Um, there's there's focus groups being run this side of Christmas, which we um, we posted about last week and um, UCD are running those focus groups on behalf of the Department of Education. So there's a way of your child and you getting involved and having your say. The first stage of the review of the Act was um, a survey that ran over the summer months, um, but the next stages will be focus groups, there'll be town hall meetings, and it's really important that everybody has their say in this. Could I just say, um, I can see people are putting their hands up. We, if if you do have a question, if you could pop it into the Q&A, that would be really great. And we can keep, Mary is going to keep track of all the questions as they come in and we'll do our best to respond to them throughout the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so briefly again, and you can find all this on our website. Um, there's also the Education Admissions to School Act, and these reforms are supposed to make it easier for a child to access their local school. And that gives the minister the chance to open a special class or classes and where the National Council for Special Education has identified a need or a gap within the area. So that's that's the legislation that allows for that as well. So when we're looking at admissions to school, there's one, there's a couple of important things to note here. If refused a place in a school, in, in the school, you may appeal, and that's called a Section 29 appeal. And we will talk about that later on. And a parent had asked about that in advance as well. And I'll go into a little bit more detail later. What you need to do is ask your local CNO. And again, I'll talk about what a special education needs organiser is a little bit later to use their powers under the Act in writing. The CNO will prepare a report for the minister who can designate, designate local schools to meet the need and a parent can't appeal a school designated. OK, so they're, they're the provisions that are there under that legislation. So that Section 29 appeal is really important and people have a right to that. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later as well. And um, so under the Admissions to School Act, um, oh, I've gone backwards rather than forwards. I apologise. OK. So people also asked us about, because this is something for people that people find very difficult to navigate as well, is the whole idea of having to have an assessment report or whether you need an assessment report or not, whether your child needs a diagnosis or not. So in the education system, as it currently stands, children do not have to be diagnosed with any particular condition to qualify for extra teaching resource and assistance. Whether or not they get it is another piece, but they don't have to have a diagnosis to qualify for the teaching assistance. The school is given a certain amount of resources and has, I suppose, the freedom and the job to give support to the child that needs it the most. But a report might be helpful in planning for how to meet your child's educational needs, but it's not 100% necessary. But it might be really helpful for you to understand what your child's needs are and to just plan a plan as well for the future and for the here and now. Um, however, in when it comes to the special schools and special classes, children must have a report from a relevant professional or team of professionals. And the report must say that the student has a disability and has complex learning needs that need the support of a particular class settings and the reasons why this is the case. So it's a different different set of circumstances depending on where your child is going to go to school and different demands in terms of what reports are required. Um, so that's just a piece of information that people had asked for in advance. We also had a question about the role of the special education needs organizers. So just to give a little piece of information about this as well. And you can find more information on this um, from the National Council for Special Education on their website. Um, the CNO has responsibility for schools in the area that they serve, and you can find whoever is your special education needs organiser by looking at the NCSE website. Identifying this is what is the stated role of the CNO, identifying what kind of supports your child needs to benefit from school, identifying possible placements for disabled children within schools, resourcing schools to meet the needs of children with intellectual disabilities and other disabled children, and ensuring the resources are used efficiently in school. So um, there's one other piece on this. Um, 
this is again what the designated role of the special education needs organizer so if you are not getting this support this is what you need to be able to ask for from your CNO because this is actually the CNO's role and if you're not getting this support as a family you need to ask for this um, because this is specified that the role that is there so they must take into account professional reports and recommendations and they are there to support and advise parents of children with educational needs engage in discussions with schools and assist in planning the transition of children between schools and there to liaise with the HSE and other services if a child needs services that are funded by the HSE as well. So again, I'm not saying this is the reality for people on the ground right now in terms of the supports that people are accessing, but this is what the role of the special education needs organizer is. People asked us about this, so we're giving, I suppose, the clear information on that this evening so that you can advocate for this kind of support for you and for your child. Um, so when reflecting on that, though, about the role of the special education needs organizer, I was thinking about this earlier on and I was saying that wouldn't it be much better if our main focus was on making sure that all schools had the proper environment, resources, skills and culture to accept and support all children in the community not focusing on the child as having the difficulties, but the environment needing to change and adapt and barriers needing to be removed. So that's something that we, we need to work towards and isn't there right now for many children. So if you want more information, what we're suggesting is that these are some of the websites that might be useful to you as a family member on, on your journey and on your road. Um, the Inclusion Ireland website, and I will show that at the end, we've just revamped it recently and it has a significant section on inclusive education and your rights as a parent and as a ch and for your child. The, for information, the National Council for Special Education website, the Children's Rights Alliance is also a group that focuses um, on children's rights in Ireland and they do have free legal information as well and they have a phone line that you can contact and we'll send all this information out after this event this evening. And citizens information can also be really helpful for general advice about you and and your ch child's rights and remember you can also phone inclusion ireland if there's if there's particular questions that you have about your child in education as well so just to get more into maybe the practical part of getting support as a parent or a family member so there might be some people on the line this evening who are seasoned experts in all of this and seasoned advocates who've gone down this road many times and who have a lot of expertise um, to share about how to advocate effectively. And there might be some people who are on the call this evening who are at the very beginning of their journey. And I suppose I want to respect all of those different experiences with people who are with us this evening. Um, but when I spoke to the team about preparing for this evening, and as I said, many of our team are family members themselves of children with intellectual disabilities. Um, siblings with intellectual disabilities. Um, this is how people described it, that it is a journey when you're advocating for your child with many twists and turns and joys and challenges. And one of the main pieces that we often talk about is somehow finding a way to look after yourself as a parent during this journey, because that is incredibly challenging to do. Things are demanding. You will be talking to multiple services. You'll be trying to get a place for your child in school and you will hit bumps on that road. There is no doubt about it. So number one, and I know this has been said so many times and it is easier said than done, but it is about somehow finding that small amount of time every day to put on your own oxygen mask first and to fi figure out a way to look after yourself because in order for you to be able to advocate for your child and support your child as you want to do, the child that you love, your precious child and member of your family, you, you're you going to have to see it as a long road ahead and, and to figure out some way of looking after yourself. Um, and some of those ways of looking after yourself can, of course, be finding family support groups and peer support. Um, and Mary, who's on the, on the line with me this evening from Inclusion Ireland, one of the pieces of work that we do at Inclusion Ireland is under a wing of our organisation called the Connect Family Network. And we have a resource on our website that shows every um, family support group that we are aware of or who wants to be on the website across the country. So you can access that 
and have a look and see if there's somebody locally that you can contact and, and be with because the family support groups can be absolutely wonderful places if that's something that you would find useful as a parent. Not every parent wants a family support group or peer support, that's absolutely fine. You might have something else that helps you to look after yourself. But if that's something that interests you, you can have a look at our website to see the many groups across the country who are currently operating that we we engage with. Um, and one of the other like practical pieces of support that might be useful as you embark on your journey, or even if you're in the middle of your journey or you're well down the road, is to take a moment to sit down and make a map and name everybody in your world who can support you on this journey and how. So that might be a granny who can do an hour of babysitting once a week. It might be a neighbor who can help you bring out the bins. It might be somebody else in your life who can provide really practical support. It might be a friend who you rely on who might come to some of the tricky meetings that we'll talk about later on and who can support you and be by your side when you navigate the system. Whoever it is in your world who is an ally to you and a supporter to you, it's a really great thing to try and map that and write that down and name the supports that those people that you're going to call on them for, because there isn't a person in the world who exists without support. We all need it. We all need it in different shapes and forms. So making a map and naming that is can be a really useful, useful thing to do. And the other thing I'd say on this slide in a general way about getting support as a parent or family member that try and go to places where you can get solid and reliable information. There is so much information out there on the internet and you'll get conflicting information. One website you'll read will say one thing, you'll speak to somebody else who'll give you conflicting information. So it's really important that you go and get solid information and advice. And that's why, you know, some of the places that we've mentioned earlier in the call are important citizens information. Um, the um, Children's Rights Alliance, et cetera, reliable places to get to get the help and support that you need. Um, some more practical advocacy tips. And again, this comes from tried and tested with our family members who are staff members and from working with the Connect Family Network, what we're hearing from families work, works for them. Um, please try and correspond in writing if at all possible. And if you need help with that, um, to ask a friend to help you with that. Um, make notes of phone calls, contents of meetings straight away. Be informed or get informed, as I said, from a reputable source so that you have solid information, you know, when you're going forward to a meeting or when you're when you're advocating for something in particular. Try to manage your own well-being and response. OK, so this is really, really, really challenging. And all of us, you know, there isn't a human amongst us that doesn't find this challenging. But trying to stay calm, even when it's incredibly difficult, will ultimately help you and your child. That is challenging in the moment. It is really difficult to do that, especially if you know your child is distressed, you're distressed and there's something really critical and important going on for you and your and your family. But keeping calm and centered, even when it's difficult, will ultimately help you and your child. And again, that's back to what's going to support you to do that and what supports do you need to stay to stay centered when things are difficult and challenging. And I will talk about this in a little bit more detail in a minute to consider the objective of your, your advocacy. What's your goal and have you a fallback position? And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. And get outside advice if you're unsure or the situation is tricky. And again, that goes back to those reliable sources that you can call to get information before you take any step further. Um. So this is the specifics then, okay? So when everything is difficult, and challenging and this won't it won't always be all always difficult and challenging there are going to be really joyful times really you know great times as a family um when things go really smoothly etc but when things are very difficult our human response is always to um i suppose to look at the entire picture and everything seems to be very challenging and it's difficult to find a way forward and i suppose when it comes to advocating for your child it's so important to kind of try and take a step back and identify clearly what the main concern and problem is right now. You're not going to be able to. Nobody can. Um, 
fix everything all at once. So it's really important to look at what the main concerns are right now and put a bit of time into this. And maybe you might need help with this. You might need to talk to somebody, a trusted friend, your partner, whoever it might be to kind of really get to the bottom of what's the main concern here. So get the background of the situation. Have your records or reports who is involved. Really put time into identifying what your concerns are and what the specifics of the concerns are. And what areas of this are causing your child really particular difficulty and name the really specific issue and what you want to happen now. Um, as I said, there could be four or five issues going on. You know, there could be challenges. You're trying to access supports from the HSC. You're also trying to access a school place. What's the number one thing right now that is the particular concern and the number one issue that you need to invest your time into right now? Sorry, there's just a problem with my screen. Just one second. Oh, here we go. OK, so once you've named what the issue is, so it might be that you're having trouble with communication in school, you're not getting the information that you need about your child and what's happening for them every day. So if you say, OK, what I really want here is for communication, to improve with the school, then that's your and you're going to get specific about the solution around that. So what would be helpful in that case to improve communication? Would it be a communication diary that comes home from school with a note every day to say how your child got, got on? Is it a meeting every few weeks with the teacher? Is it a call with the teacher every few weeks to understand exactly what's happening? What's the solution that you're going to bring to the table that would really support you and your child? Or maybe it's that you need a full and clear explanation. Something has gone wrong and you need to understand exactly what happened and you need to understand everything about that situation. So is that the solution that you need right now? Whatever it is to name that and to get as specific as possible about it, because otherwise we're going into meetings and situations and it's about everything. Um, but we need to have one step forward and we need to understand the most critical thing for our child to really get some some results that are going to make a difference for, for your child and for your family. So preparation is everything in advocacy. The most important thing is that you can find out who's the best person to talk to about the issue. Um, who can you meet and who can be your supporter in that meeting? Is it your partner? Is it a friend? Can you bring somebody with you who you trust? Maybe it's a, a fellow parent, a peer who's gone down this road before. And, and having somebody there to support you is really, really essential. We did get a question in advance about translators in schools, and there doesn't seem to be a provision specifically for translators in schools. It's down to individual schools and what can be facilitated. So we did get a question about that in advance. The HSE does have some provision in their services for translation services, but but we cannot find information Um about local schools having facilities for translation services. So it's even the mo more important if English isn't your first language to have a supporter or an ally with you or a friend who can help you in those kind of meetings. Make sure if you are having a meeting and it's about a significant issue that there's a decision maker at that meeting. So ask for a manager, ask for somebody, ask for the school principal, ask for somebody who can help make decisions. Um, prepare by knowing how to tell your story clearly and putting your child at the center of it. Um, so that might seem really obvious, but sometimes when we go into a meeting, because we might be stressed, um, we might be distressed, there might be a particular, there might be a lot of issues going on. It's really important that you have real clarity on what the story is and the points that you're trying to get across. Um, get the information in advance that you need about policy, about the law, about your rights. And again, I've signposted you to some um, some websites that you can get more detail around that and decide what support you need. Um, maybe you need support to write a letter. Maybe you need support for the meetings. Maybe you need support to talk things out afterwards or debrief with somebody. Whatever it is that you need, write that down too and make sure that you have that around you when you're advocating for your child as well. There's nothing lonelier than coming out of a meeting and not having that support in place for yourself. So you know, if it's a trusted friend from a family advocacy group, if it's, you know, 
um, your sister or your brother or somebody you know who's been in a similar situation that you have somebody you can talk this out with. Um, that's really, really important to have that support in place for yourself. And again, find the best way to communicate in the particular situation is a telephone, email, post, in person, whatever way the best way is. Um, make sure that you uh, you take that take that path. Um, so this is there's there's information we're going to send out after the meetings, and we are going to create a resource on handy tips for for advocacy um, for your child and with your child. Um, and some of these tips are taken from a family advocacy advocacy tools um, from Australia, and we will send around a link to this resource as well. And I suppose meetings, you know, again, some of this information might be very um, straightforward for some people on the call who've who've gone down this road before. But it's no harm in reminding ourselves about how to manage and handle a meeting well so that you get the results for your child and for your family. So I guess it's seeing a meeting as an opportunity for sharing information. One of the most important things that you can do to set the tone in a meeting, if you really have your eyes on the prize for getting the results that you need for your child, is to acknowledge what is working well and acknowledging those who do support your child right now well. So, for example, you might be going into a school situation and you might be meeting the teacher and the SNA. Sometimes it can be really helpful to start the meeting by saying, I noticed that the SNA has a really fabulous way with my child and she spoke to him in this tone of voice and he responded really well to that. And I noticed that and that was a really beautiful thing to see. So that we're starting with um, a positive note and starting the meeting in that way. And then we can move into however the issue that we face is X. So, so it's just trying to build that relationship and point out where things are working for your child, because sometimes that's that's what you know as a family member more than anybody else. You know where your child thrives and flourishes and is at their best. Um, you know the situations that they flourish in, the kind of people um, that they enjoy being around, the kind of tone of voice that they enjoy hearing, the kind of environment that they feel most comfortable in. You know that best as a family member. So when you come to a meeting, to talk about the problems, you're also coming with those solutions. My child is at their best when people speak to him in this way. My child is at his best when he has lots of space around him and his desk and his environment isn't too cluttered. He finds the clutter really distressing. My child is at his best when he has movement breaks and can leave the classroom when he needs to with the support maybe of his SNA. Um, my child flourishes best when he gets to go outside in the yard a couple of times per day. So going in with a really strong list of when your child is flourishing and how the school could try and recreate that on a daily basis all day um, is really, really helpful and a critical way of supporting your child. So during meetings, allowing time for everybody to speak and everybody gets a chance to have their say. And then focusing on achieving one outcome or maybe a couple of actions for your child. What's your minimum expectation? So when you walk out that door, what do you really need to have resolved? What is the number one piece that you need to have resolved? So again, just reiterating, this is a journey and not everything is going to be solved with one meeting. What's the top thing that will make a difference? Is that my child needs more movement breaks? My child needs to be in a less busy space in the classroom. Um, what is the one thing that you feel will make the greatest difference for your child? And that everybody walks out the door of that meeting feeling we can achieve that and that's something concrete that we can work on together. So again, being prepared, allowing time to think and plan. And unless really essential, no last minute meetings. We often get caught in this trap and it's something that can be very stressful for family members that a meeting is called last minute and we feel under pressure to turn up and we haven't had the time to think about it, to think about what supports we need to turn up at the meeting, to make our list of issues, to have somebody to attend with us, to support us. So where possible, try our best to avoid any last minute meetings, unless it's absolutely essential. Like if something really significant happens for your child, if they, for example, if there was an allegation of abuse or there was something that was really significant, of course, 
a meeting ASAP is absolutely critical. But for everything else, you need time as a family member to really think about it and think about what you need and what your child needs. And being rushed into these meetings doesn't give you a chance to really advocate properly. The other things about meetings to try and find where possible, this isn't always easy and I'm not suggesting any of this is easy, believe me, but is there is there common ground? Is there a win-win situation, as I mentioned earlier, one goal that you can work on together that will make a big difference and that everybody walks out the door feeling that this situation is going to improve? Have a think about, again, this is back to us staying centered during meetings, which is incredibly difficult. Um, but having again, so it's so important to not be rushed into meetings because then you don't get a chance to have a think about this. What might make you upset or make you angry and what will help you cope better? Um, so being able to have a think about that in advance, bringing your partner, friend or family member for support and to take notes right up, you know, and maybe your your family member, or your partner, or your friend can help you with this afterwards to write up a brief meeting summary of any important points that were made and listing any actions that were agreed. This is so important when these actions are to take place and who's responsible for the actions. So some of the actions might be for you as a family member. Some of the actions might be for the teacher. Some might be for the principal. So writing down what those actions are, when they are to take place and who's responsible is really important. And then you can compare this. If there's a meeting summary sent around, if the school sends you a summary of the meeting, you can compare it then to your notes afterwards and make sure that you're happy with how the meeting was reflected and share your notes if there's any differences between the two. So these are just really practical tips for meetings that we hope are useful for family members. And hopefully, you know, for people who are seasoned family members who've been to many of these meetings, hopefully it's just giving you um, some more information or a space to pause and think about meetings and how to make them more effective and to work for you and for your child. Um, so not everything goes right, as we know, uh, every day. And you do have rights and your child has rights in terms of complaints. Um, and it's just to be really clear that making a complaint in the school, um, each school will have a complaints policy and procedure, which is really important to follow. Um, and the Department of Education has no role in this because schools are managed by the Board of Management on behalf of the school patrons. Um, and the department has no role in the employment of staff in schools or school or our day to day management. And so a complaint has to be made through the through the school system. So I'm just giving you the facts about that matter, do you know, because that's often confusing for families and people often ask us about that. But each um, complaint does have to go through the process as set out by the school. Um, what we always say about complaints at Inclusion Ireland, you know, unless this is something incredibly significant, again, if your child's safety and welfare is in question, then you need to do what you need to do. And, you know, there's steps that you can follow and immediate actions that you need to take. And we can talk about that a bit later. But for general things, like if you're not happy with how things are being communicated, and we did get a couple of questions in, in advance about this. For example, people not being that pleased with how the teacher is engaging with them, feeling maybe not heard or not understood or being a little bit dismissed or not being believed about, you know, the child's experience at home compared to the child's experience in school. So maybe the school feeling that the child is doing great in school, model child, everything is wonderful. And the parent saying that, well, actually, when he comes home, he's absolutely exhausted and he's potentially masking all day in school and hiding how distressed he is. And then when he comes home, he's having a lot of difficulties at home in the family. So sometimes what we heard in a couple of emails that we got in advance of this evening is that people are feeling that they're not really being believed. So I suppose the important first steps with that is if you're worried about that is to try to organize a meeting with the class teacher and they're the best person to approach first for an informal discussion before you go into any formal complaints process and again using the tips and tools that we talked about in the in how to prepare for a meeting and how to make that meeting productive positive and that you get the results that you need for the child 
Um, if your complaint is about a staff member excluding the principal, um, you should contact the school principal. If it's a complaint about the principal, you should talk to the board of the school. Um, and obviously teaching staff are usually in the classroom all day. So leaving a message with the office is the way to, to organize a meeting. Um, if the teacher can't help or if you're not satisfied with the response, you can obviously talk to the principal um, and again, organizing that meeting through the school office and using the tips and tools for effective meetings is really important. So as we said, you know, the school has then a complaints process. If you're not getting satisfaction from the kind of more informal approach, you've stayed calm, you've really explored things as best you can, but you're really not getting the results that you need for you, your family member, your child. Um, then, you know, following that complaints process is really, really important. And following it to the letter is really important as well. And you might need support with that if you find that challenging to follow. You know, you might need a family member or somebody else to support you with that process. But every school has a complaints process that you can follow. And as I said earlier, though, if you're concerned about your child's welfare, for example, if there was an allegation, you thought that your child was unsafe or was being harmed or allegedly harmed, or you were noticing something that you were not happy with, that is a really serious issue, you might ask the school to refer the issue to TUSLA. And all schools have a safeguarding protocol and a safety statement for children and a safeguarding statement, sorry. And you can also contact TUSLA separately if you felt that this was a really significant concern. So that's really, really important to, to mention. TUSLA are the state agency responsible for protecting children from abuse and harm. So that is open to people as well. And we know that we have family members contacting us who have gone down that route as well. Um, and that is that is something that is available to people to, to pursue as well. But again, get advice on that, get information, know your rights before you, you go ahead. But your primary concern is always going to be the safety and well-being of your child. And you're well within your rights to pursue that if that's if that's what you need to do for your child. OK, if you follow the complaints process and you haven't been satisfied and you haven't gotten the answer that you need, once you've exhausted that complaints process through the various stages of it, you can also contact the Ombudsman for Children to take that further as well. And they deal with complaints relating to the administrative actions of a school, provide it, as I said, the complainant, that would be the family member, you, the parent, has firstly and fully followed the school's complaints procedures. OK. Um, just going to mention a couple of things briefly, which came in through email and requests for more information on this about school um, appeals um, and processes. So you are within your rights as a family member to appeal against any suspension after 20 days, an expulsion or a refusal of a school to enroll your child. And there's two different ways that a school may refuse to enroll your child. And I'll talk about those in a minute. And you can appeal both of those. So this appeal against a refusal to enroll is divided into these two sections and they're slightly different. A refusal to enroll due to oversubscription. So that's where your child is turned down for a school place because there's too many children and the school says that they can facilitate your child. There's one way of, of um, appealing that. Um, and there's also another grounds to appeal, which is refusal to enroll for any other reason. So you might, the school might say, we can't accept your child because we don't have the resources to do so. We can't accept your child because we don't have the facilities to do so. And you might decide to appeal that as well. And there's ways that you can do that under um, Section 29. So the most important thing before you apply for any school place is that you find out about the school's enrollment process from the school principal. And when applying for a school place, make sure. And again, these things sound obvious, but really important to say that the application form is fully complete and you've included all of the information with your application. You cannot use information in the review or the appeal process that was not made available with your initial application for a place in the school. So that's why it's so important to complete that fully. 
and your local special education needs organization should be providing advice and guidance as well. And if they're not, you need to contact them and contact them maybe in writing. And if you're not getting satisfaction to contact their manager and get the support that you need at this stage. So there are stages to this process and these are all set out on our website. So I'm not going to go into them in huge detail this evening, but I'll show you where you can find them on our website later as well. Um, so as I said, if you were if your child was refused a place in school for reasons other than the school being oversubscribed, there's a number of stages to that process, including a request for a review by the Board of Management um, after the school board, there's an appeal to the Department of Education, etc. And again, all of these are outlined on our website, so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail this evening. But we'll send out this information afterwards to everybody who is interested in learning more about it too, because it is an important part of your rights as well. Oh, I'm actually going back for some reason. Apologies. That just jumped on me. Just bear with me one second. Okay. OK. Um, the joys of technology. OK, just to mention as well, because we did get a question about this in advance, the reduced timetables. This is such a significant issue and has a major impact on children with disabilities more than any other child. You do not have to, as a family member, agree to this. Your child absolutely has a right to education. So if a reduced timetable is introduced, you can again appeal this after a full 20 days have elapsed. This is really important. And again, this is a Section 29 appeal. And you can also complain to the board of the school if this is the case. Um, just to mention, because I mentioned earlier about student support plans um, and that under Epson, if Epson, the legislation had fully started, all children should be entitled to an individual education plan or an IEP. But because Epson hasn't fully started, nobody is legally entitled to this as of yet. So student support plans are something that schools have put in place. And many schools do a really great job on this and provide student support plans um, right now. If your child doesn't have one, you can ask for one, you know, and it's really important that best practice with uh, with the support plan is that parents are consulted about it. They're facilitated to be involved. They receive a copy of it and advised of any significant changes within it and receive a report of any review of the education plan. That's what best practice is. This is not a legal requirement though of the school but it is best practice and it's really important you ask for one and many schools as I said are actually doing this and doing this quite well um tips for during the support planning it's your child so you get to ask lots of questions and many questions and ensuring that the plan has goals short-term ones longer-term ones you get to ask questions about how did last year's plan work out did it go well did it not go well what worked what didn't and give your input again that practical input you know when your child flourishes, you know when your child is at their best and how can the school create those conditions for your child and do that every day. So it's a chance for you to, to name those things, what your child needs to thrive and flourish. The school isn't going to have all the answers to that. They're not going to have access to all the resources that they need, but there might be really practical things they can do to support your child on a day-to-day -day basis, reducing noise, giving your child a little bit of time out in the yard, extra time um, in a quiet space. Um, maybe they have a particular peer that they absolutely love and they like spending time with. Whatever the things are that help your child to flourish, these should be the things that are discussed as part of their support plan as well, because that will help your child to have the best education experience that they can have. Um, just briefly going to mention transitions to secondary school. Major um, information from us is that, you know, planning at least two years in advance, you might need an updated assessment for any enrollment. Um, you might need to go down the assessment of needs route again, which is a whole other webinar, which we can talk about at a later date. Um, 
you might need support to help prepare a communication passport or something that will help your child to transition from primary school to to secondary school. And again, you do have rights under the Section 29 appeal to challenge if your child is not getting a school place. We did get a question about the Leaving Cert applied in advance of this evening as well. Um, and, you know, people saying that not every school does it. And that is true. Um, not every school runs a Leaving Cert applied, which is a separate curriculum altogether. Um, and again, you know, this is something that individually you will need to bring up with the school and again if you need to follow the complaints process within the school about that that's something that is open to you as well um assistive technology is another support that's available and we will circulate this afterwards about what your child's rights are in terms of accessing assistive technology in school um there is a particular circular from the department which is the scheme of grants towards the purpose purchase of essential assessive technology and equipment and the assessment itself has to show that the child without this assistive technology would have challenges accessing the curriculum and accessing um, their right to education so that's that's important to mention as well conscious of time I hope that we've answered a lot of the questions as they've come in um, I can see some of the comments in the Q&A the schools are not adequately resourced to provide the support for all children. We absolutely agree. They're expected to make impossible and cruel decisions every year. And this, yeah, I there's nothing there that we we disagree with. It is absolutely not just, um, you know, it is an issue of, of resourcing as well. We totally wholeheartedly agree. And we understand from working with schools, you know, the very real challenges the schools are facing and trying to support every child. Um, so totally agree. Somebody said, as a teacher and a parent, UDL needs to be widespread. Too many children are others. We 100% chime in with you there and, and agree with that. And what the what this person is referring to, um, universal design for learning needs to be widespread. So that's really setting up environments that are welcoming and supportive for all children. So we don't need to talk about the needs that children have because the environments are all already set up they're resourced they're welcoming and they're they're um they're ready to accept every child in the community and support every child so that's that's the vision isn't it for the future what's essential for some children this is another comment that has come in what's essential for some children will be beneficial for all again wholeheartedly agree there um so there's one or two things about appeals for assistive technology and we might come back to those people afterwards um, with a particular appeal process around technology. I'll just have to look up the particular circular from the department, but we'll write out to everybody with that information afterwards. So if an assistive technology application is rejected by a special education needs organizer, is there a way to appeal it? We'll, we'll come back on that information. Um, so yeah, I think we have answered mo I'm just making sure there's nothing I've missed there in the the Q and A. Um yeah is there a way to go beyond the CNO if you're not getting adequately adequate support? And absolutely there's a whole structure within the National Council for Special Education. So if you're not getting information back from your special education needs organizer you're well within your rights to contact the national council for special education and ask to speak to a manager or somebody somebody in charge as well there's you know there's no reason why you can't do that um okay i'll just briefly just get to the end of the presentation now that i've checked the q a box to make sure i haven't missed anything um so I suppose my final question, and I will wrap up the seminar within the next couple of minutes, is how can we work together? Um, I'm delighted that online as well, we have Lucinda Murray, Murray, who is our new head of communications at Inclusion Ireland. She's just recently joined the team. We've been having a lot of conversations about our work in 2024, 2025 and onwards. And one of the main focuses we are absolutely determined to have is how to build a better and more inclusive education system for all our children. And we just feel that an inclusive education system benefits every child. You know, this is whether you have a disabled child or not, inclusive classrooms, inclusive schools are just, they have 
massive benefits for for every child in our community. And we want to help people to understand that over the next couple of years and work together in collaboration with family members and any other anybody else who wants to come on this journey with us. So we're going to invest a lot of our time and resources and you'll hear from us in 2024 talking about inclusive education and how to build a better system. And we know we need to navigate the here and now because there's children who need support right now, who need help right now. And we also need to paint a picture for a better future for children coming through and a more inclusive model of education. And we're really determined to see that happen at, Inclu at Inclusion Ireland. So we'd love you to be more involved with us. We'd love people on the call this evening. If you'd like to become a member of Inclusion Ireland, all you need to do is go onto our website. It's inclusionireland.ie. If you're not working, membership is one euro every year. If you are working, it's 10 euro per year. This is not a money making venture from Inclusion Ireland, as you can tell by our price, our price structure. It's more that we actually want to make sure that we are engaged, listening and understanding the very reality that children and their families are facing. So our members, you're the first to hear about our events. You get to come to our AGM and vote and have motions and, and shape the future of the organization. Um, you're the first people that we consult with and engage with to make sure that we have our ears to the ground and understand the very real challenges that you're facing and also where things are working, because that's really important too. We want to hear about where things are working for children so we can replicate that across the country as well and share that story. So you'll also receive regular newsletters from us, etc. So we would love anybody who's on the call this evening, if you want to go to our website and if that's something you'd like to do to join our membership, and then we can keep in touch more and stay in contact and I suppose build this movement for change, which is the vision for a more inclusive Ireland and a more inclusive education system for all of our children. Just to say a very big thank you this evening. Pobble are one of our funders and they support the Connect Family Network. Um, and, you know, the information talks that we do every year for children and families to IRD Dulhallo for being a great partner over the years and for supporting us with the event this evening and making sure that they reached out to families and, and people in their community. So a really big thank you to, to all of you. Um, please do stay in touch with us. You'll be hearing a lot more from us over the next year or two about inclusive education. And it would be great if you could put into the Q&A before you leave the webinar this evening. If there's information that you want to hear from us next year at Inclusion Ireland, are there specific things that you want to know more about, that you need help and support with as a family member when you're advocating for your child, please could you pop a note into the Q&A for us now because we are designing our workshops and our information talks for next year and we want to make sure that they meet your needs and we want to make sure that they're making a difference in, in your life every day as well. So thank you all for being with us this evening. Thanks to Mary, Lucinda and Team Inclusion Ireland for bringing this all together and to IRD Dilhallo. And we will talk to you all soon. So please pop something in the Q&A before you leave about information talks. We'd be delighted to hear from you. Take care.